All right, so um, so from today, we are going to um, start volume two of the textbooks, okay? So then uh, in volume two, so this is starting from chapter one again, okay? So I think we finished uh, volume one of the textbook now, volume two here. Um, so chapter one in volume two, this is on temperature and heat, okay? I think a lot of concepts uh, you guys have already learned either somewhere else or pretty much it's it's kind of straightforward like temperature and heat right temperature is straightforward um, but we'll talk about the uh, formal definition of it in physics here um, again um, I just like to remind you guys that number two is still on um, Thursday okay so it's uh, just about like three a uh, little bit over three days for now <clears throat> for now okay so, and then for classroom disinfection today, um, it's assigned to Noah and Casey, okay? Um, so let's get started. <clears throat> All right, so temperature, um, so you guys have might have seen this or may not, but uh, this is like a very, very old fashioned of the um, thermometer that used to measure temperature. We actually have some of this in the, in the lab here, okay? So you guys may see, those um, in one of the labs, perhaps this week's and next week's, okay? So in this thermometer, so it's it's made of alcohol inside. So outside it's glass and then with the scales, but inside the liquid inside, it's made of alcohol with red dye. So you can see the color of it, okay? So um, as temperature goes up, um, the liquid will expand and then if temperature cools down, the liquid will swing. So then you can see the indication of what temperature from the scale there, okay? Um, so in physics, we assign high value of something with the hot object and low value of it with the cold object. That's called temperature, okay? So um, that's how it's been defined in physics. All right, and then the SI unit for temperature is not Fahrenheit. It's not Celsius that you see often in um, science, but it's actually called Kelvin, okay? So uh, keep that in mind. The SI unit for it is Kelvin. Uh, you might be seeing like other uh, types of thermometers uh, rather than the one in, in the previous uh, figure. So something like this, okay? So if you have something like this, uh, thermometer like this, um, likely it's made of uh, bimetal um, straps inside it. So there's a strap inside made of two metals. And they kind of um, expand or shrink differently um, to a different extent um, when the temperature changes, okay? So um, then it will uh, point to either uh, this side or that side, okay? According to the temperature. <clears throat> All right. Um, these days, you probably um, see like the digital ones more often, okay? And then the, um, those uh, like the ones have the scale or the one like with liquid, okay? So, and for digital ones, you can um, easily um, have like two different scales from Fahrenheit to Celsius, okay? Or the other way around. Um, so we are using Fahrenheit in this um, country very often, but uh, most of the rest of the world, um, they are using Celsius, okay? So if you cross the border to the north side in Canada, they use Celsius. Um, to the south side in Mexico, they also use um, Celsius. Or across the ocean to the Asian countries or European countries, they all use um, Celsius, okay? <laughs> so um, it will be very useful that we know how to convert from one scale to another scale, okay? So as I mentioned, um, uh, we use Fahrenheit here, and then um, in science um, classes, if you guys are taking science, other science or engineering classes, it's pretty much like in Celsius most of the time. But the SI unit would be Kelvin, okay? So these are the um, scales for different, or this, yeah, the different scales are listed here. So in Celsius and in Kelvin um, system, the difference is the same. So five difference in Celsius, like five degrees, that's the same in Kelvin in five degrees. Okay, so that means uh, they are these two scale is just a shift of a number. All right. So um, so from Celsius to Kelvin, you pretty much at this guy, okay, 273.15 uh, 
to the Celsius to get Kelvin. Okay, on the other way around, you subtract this number from Kelvin to get Celsius. Okay, but um, from Fahrenheit to Celsius, um, it's a different uh, scale here. So nine degree Fahrenheit is corresponding to five degree Celsius. Okay. Um, now let's look at the conversion factors between Fahrenheit and the Celsius, okay? Because from Celsius and Kelvin, um, they are um, kind of straightforward, just um, offset by one number. But from Fahrenheit to Celsius, it's a different story here. So um, typically on the different scales, okay? So the freezing or like you can pick two reference, uh, reference points so most often uh, pick ones are like the freezing temperature and um, boiling temperature of water. So in Fahrenheit, 30 deg 32 degree in, uh, for freezing of water, boiling of water is at 212 degrees. In Celsius, um, zero degree is the freezing point of water. 100 degree is the boiling temperature of water, okay? So, when you want to come up with a con uh, conversion factor between the two or conversion formula between the two. So mathematically, you pick up two points, okay? Um, for the same event to be happening. Um, so for example, for water freezing and then water boiling, right? So then you write out in the, um, the two scales, uh, what would be the number there. Converting from two scales should be a linear, okay? So. I'm going to give you guys an example on how you do this and then you can do this by your own um, if you are going to make a conversion between any other two scales, okay? So say you want to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, right? Because chances are you are going to travel in a country that is using Celsius. And then you wonder um, when they talk about temperature, when they say 20 degrees, um, what, what does that correspond to in your um, more familiar scale of Fahrenheit, right? So let's say you want um, temperature in Fahrenheit. So I'm going to do it this way, T sub F, that means I want the temperature in Fahrenheit. And then that's equal to a linear relationship between temperature in Celsius, right? I'm going to put a parameter, like a constant number in front of it, A, T sub C plus B, right? So this is a linear function. This is like Y equals to M X plus B, right? That's a linear um, relationship between X and Y, okay? So then the same here, this is your X, this is your Y, but um, we are talking about temperature. So I'm going to use TF and then TC here. And we pick up two reference points for freezing of water. It happens at 32 degree Fahrenheit, okay? That is equal to, it happens at, for Celsius, it happens at zero degrees, right? Plus B. So this is uh, water freezing. Uh, when water freezes at that point. Um, for the boiling of water, Okay, when water boils, it boils at 212 degree Fahrenheit, right? But in degree Celsius, it's at 100 degree, right? Plus B, okay? So you have two references. You can come up with two equations there between the two scales. Now you can solve for the two parameters, okay? So from the first equation, you can realize that A times zero should be zero, right? So that goes to zero. So that tells you B is equal to 32 degree Fahrenheit directly, okay? So your B is 32 degree Fahrenheit. Then you take B into here, you can solve for your A, okay? So 212 A times 100 degree Celsius plus 32 degree Fahrenheit, okay? So then subtract um, both sides by 32 degrees. A of 100 degrees Celsius, this is 180 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Equals to A times 100 degrees Celsius. And then divide both sides by 100 degrees Celsius. That will be your A, okay? So your A is equal to like 1.8, right? Or nine over five, 
if you write in fraction degrees over Fahrenheit over degrees Celsius. Okay. So you get your A, you get your B, then this um, conversion equation can be obtained. So it's nine over five times TC plus 32, okay? I'm going to just leave the units out, but you can write it in here, it doesn't matter, okay? So that's what we get um, on the slide. nine over five TC plus 32, okay? So this is how you um, can come to this conversion factor over here, all right? You can do the same thing um, to get the other way around for um, converting from TF to TC, right? So similarly, you are going to write like TC because that's what you want is equal to say, now C times TF plus D, okay? And then you can pick your two reference points and then solve for the C and D, okay? Solve for those two. So then you can have conversion from TF to TC, okay? From Fahrenheit to degree Celsius, okay? Um, you guys can do that by your own, um, just following the procedure. But um, then you should get the result of like this, okay? So from Fahrenheit to Celsius, it's going to be um, subtract 32 from the Fahrenheit, okay, first, and then multi multiply the result by five ninths, okay, to get a um, degree in Celsius, okay? So that's conversion from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Um, so let's take a look on the exercise here on the lowest temperature um, ever rec recorded on Earth. So that was um, 1983, July 21st, okay, which is um, on, um, which is like minus 82.89.2 degrees. Celsius. So what's this in Fahrenheit? So you're converting from uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit. So you are going to just use the equation that we just got here, right? So it's, it will be this guy. Here. So be straightforward, just plug in a number there, we'll get you the lowest temperature ever in Fahrenheit. All right, so you put 89.2 minus there, and then the result will be minus 12 or minus 128.56, right? You can keep uh, just three six fix, all right? Minus 129 or that, okay? All right. <laughs> So I think most of you guys got this one right, um, except one looks like it's a typo to me, but the one says one minus one zero two point nine six. I think that's probably like a typo there. But um, let me know if you have a question on this one. All right. Um, 
Now, in the very early days, um, or oh, actually it's true here today as well, you can actually determine the temperature of an object of the gas system by using an apparatus look like this, okay? So you have a gas that is confined in a container, um, like a jar here, which is submerged into say water bath, okay? So you can keep the temperature of water quite constant. And you can um, have the, like this level fixed over here, all right? Now you can change the temperature of water by like heating it or cooling it, okay? Like add ice to it or whatever. Then temperature will be changing then the gas here will be expanding or uh, shrinking, but you can adjust the level of this mercury on the other side. It could be mercury or it could be other like liquid in the tubes here to keep the volume the same um, in responding to the temperature change. So then the different levels from this side of tube and this side of tube will be indicating what the pressure is inside the gas container of the gas. And then temperature, you can use a thermometer to read it, okay? So then um, this device is called a gas thermometer, okay? So pressure is proportional to the temperature or in the other way around, if you can measure the temperature or the pressure by taking the difference of the, these two uh, mercury surface level heights, then um, you can calculate what's the temperature of, that, of this if you don't have a thermometer, okay? So this is a very old fashioned um, in that case, you can find that um, if temperature goes down, so then the pressure will go down, okay? So you can, you can probably realize, um, so the temperature goes down enough, so then these two levels will be the same. So there will be like zero pressure inside, so that will be the lower limits for the temperature, okay? And for the pressure inside the gas system, you cannot have um, zero pressure or you cannot have like minus pressure, okay? Because for a gas system, um, the pressure of the gas system is determined by um, the movement of the gas, right? So it's like hitting the wall and then um, exert force on the wall. So in that way, it produces pressure, right? You cannot have something like gas molecular like um, introducing negative force on the wall, right? So in that case, the pressure can be, cannot be negative. So that means the temperature cannot be um, lower than a certain temperature, okay? Indeed, you can do experiment and then um, like for different gases, you, if you try one gas now to be um, like uh, systematically, to do a systematic study, you want to apply to a second gas or maybe uh, three or four more. So in that case, you can like measure the temperature of the gas system and then the pressure. Now you might not, it's always difficult to get very low, low temperature, but you can get like normal range of temperature and then you can back extract the data, okay? Uh, so you'll figure out they all comes to one common point of minus 27.15 degrees Celsius, all right? And you couldn't go to the lower pressure because pressure low limit is zero. So then this is the low limit for the temperature of the gas system, okay? So it's minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. And um, we define that as absolute zero in Kelvin scale. So that's um, uh, how the Kelvin scale can be determined. So from Kelvin scale, um, if it's zero, that means um, in Celsius minus 273.15. So then Kelvin equals to Celsius plus 273.15, okay? Uh, with that, you can actually um, have conversions between any of those, um, those three, any two of those three scales, okay? So from Celsius to Fahrenheit, you can get a conversion equation here from Fahrenheit to Celsius, Celsius to Kelvin, Kelvin to Celsius, and then the other way, um, or the, the last ones are the Fahrenheit to Kelvin and then Kelvin to Fahrenheit, okay? All right. Uh, next, let's take a look on this example here, say normal body temperature for human is 98.6, 
degree Fahrenheit, what's the corresponding temperature in degree Celsius and Kelvins, All right? So yeah, converting from Fahrenheit to Celsius first and then uh, from Celsius to Kelvin. You can do it that way or you can um, convert directly from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. All right, so most of you guys have your responses in. Uh, we can take a look. So basically for part A, you're going to do TC equals to five over nine, TF minus 32, okay? So it will be five over nine of 98.6 minus 32. That gives you exactly 37 degrees, okay? And then from here to here, so TK will be equal to 37 degrees plus 273.15, okay? So that's 310.15 degrees Celsius. Uh, Kelvin, that's in Kelvin, okay? And then also on the temperature expression, I think I uh, didn't mention it. So for degree Celsius, you usually write um, degree Celsius, right? And then degree, or degree Fahrenheit and then degree Celsius. Now Kelvin is just K, okay? It doesn't have a circle, okay? It's just K. Um, in some cases, you might be um, seeing people writing degree Celsius as F first and then degree to the right, okay? And that's because um, some people want to avoid that in case like you are saying like 10 degrees Celsius, right? If you write in this way, it could be misread as 100 Fahrenheit, okay? So then some people write like 10 Fahrenheit degrees, but um, when you are pr in printing, it's clear because the zero is the um, super script, but in writing, um, some people might do that, okay? All right. All right, one more thing here. So when you are, I have to share first. Okay. When you are um, in expert TA, all right? So now your TC is 37, okay? So that, 
doesn't make it much difference between 110.15 degree or, or 110 degrees. Okay, so these two are the same. But when this temperature is very high, very cold or very small, um, like very close to the zero in K, okay, so say minus whatever, like 273 or 72.1, all right? Then you want to include the 0.15 here because in expert EA, in that case, if you are dropping the 0.15, it may make a different, a big difference in percentage, okay? So expert EA accept your values in a certain percentage wise, like minus positive 5% or ish. So in that case, it's always safe to include the 0.15, okay? Not dropping the um, yeah, not dropping the fraction. So because I I saw a couple of you guys uh, when you submit the answer for B, it's just one three hundred and ten. Okay, and I'm assuming that's considering the significant figures. Okay, but as I mentioned, um, if your result is like 0.5 Kelvin, okay, then that 0.15 will matter. Okay, so just pay attention when you get to very small numbers as your answer. All right. So next we are going to take a look at the response of material as temperature changes, okay? So um, in Mount Vernon, I don't see a lot of like um, bridges like this. So, but in like cities, like for example, in in New York or in Chicago. I lived in Chicago for about 10 years. So I know a lot of bridges over there has like this um, structure in between two concretes. Okay, so there's gaps over here. So that's because um, the material, the concrete expand as temperature goes up. Okay, so you want to have some gap here. So then there's not stress building up on the, the whole uh, bridge over here. Okay, so, um, Expansion of material, we call it delta L. So in one dimension, okay, the length of L change that is uh, equal to a constant number times temperature change. Okay, so for um, material, so it's proportional to temperature increase. And then the other way around as well. So if temperature decreases, then it will shrink, okay, by a certain amount. If we use mathematical expression, then um, delta L divided by L, the length, original length of it, equals to alpha times delta T, okay? Alpha is a constant called coefficient of linear expansion. If you write alpha, it's equal to delta L over L divided by delta T, okay? And that alpha has a unit for Kelvin inverse, because you can see the dimension over here, this is change in, meet, uh, in length should be in meters as a unit over meters and then divide by temperature, okay? Degree Celsius or Kelvin, okay? Because this is delta T, so that means change in temperature. Change in temperature is the same um, in number as in Kelvin in, and in Celsius, right? Five degree in Kelvin is the same five degree in Celsius. So these two are the same. Okay, equivalent to each other in that sense. All right. Now this alpha can be um, written as taking the limit of delta T equal to zero. Okay, so in some cases, alpha may be temperature dependent. Okay, so um, especially when you go to the lower temperature range, like very close to absolute zero Kelvin of Kelvin in zero, then it's pretty much temperature dependent. Otherwise, in under normal conditions, in for a wide range of temperatures, it's kind of linear. Okay. But when it's temperature dependent, then you'll do you'll be doing um, derivative of L over dt, okay, and then divided by the original length of the L. So as I mentioned, this coefficient is materials dependent. So you can see if you need this coefficient, you can look it up in the table um, for coefficient of thermal expansion for different materials. So typically 
metals okay has more or larger alpha okay, and then the other solid all right however liquids will have larger alpha than than solids okay so if you have other um, like gasoline water etc it will have larger number than these numbers okay so but these are still in the 10 to the negative six, even for metals. Okay, so relative small numbers, all right? So for thermal ex expansion, one of the application will be um, for um, the thermest, the, the strip over here. So again, it's made of two different materials. So that's temperature change, they shrink or expand differently according to uh, temperature change. So then in that case, this will um, introduce a torque inside a uh, strap here, we will make this needle point to appropriate temperature. Okay, so that's called a bi bimetal um, thermostat. If you have a um, very old thermostat like this one, it's probably made of this, okay? This is one of the early applications. Um, now, we introduce the linear coefficient um, of expansion, we say that's in one dimensional, but materials actually have uh, more than one dimension, right? One dimensions, it has like two dimensions of three dimensions, most of the cases. And then if you hit the material, it will also expand in other directions, okay? So it will expand in all directions. For two dimensional materials, say if you have a sheet of something, then it will expand in both X and Y direction, okay? And then if you have a three-dimensional like a block, it will expand in all directions, X, Y, and Z, okay? So how much is the, like for three, for two-dimensional material, how much is the aerial expansion? And then for three-dimensional, how much is the volume expansion? Okay, that's the question we pretty much are interested here. So um, for two-dimensional expansion, so the change in the area is approximately equal to twice of linear or one dimensional coefficient times the original area times change in temperature, okay? We can show this uh, by looking at the example of if you have a square sheet, okay? So say if you have a square sheet, If you have a square sheet like this, all right, it's very thin. So then we just um, need to look at its two dimensional expansion. So if you hit it, we know it's going to expand in both direction, right? In X direction. So if this is L, then the expansion will be delta L. And then also in the Y direction will be expanded by delta L too, right? So then this will be your new square. This is, will be a square of L plus delta L. This will be your increase in area, okay? So then what's the increase in area? It will be L plus delta L square minus original area, L square, right? So. A is equal to L squared, the original area, A prime equal to L plus delta L squared, the area under uh, after expansion, all right? And then from linear expansion, we know this delta L should be equal to alpha times L times delta T, right? T is the um, temperature change, okay? Like that. So then this is my delta L, delta L is equal to this. And we can expand the square here. It becomes L square plus twice L times delta L times delta L square, okay? Minus L square, okay? So this is my delta A. So you can see this and this will cancel out, all right? And then two times L, Take this as your delta L 
times alpha times L times delta T plus alpha times L times delta T square. Okay, so this will become twice of alpha and then L square delta T plus alpha square L square delta T square. Okay. Now, typically, if this is a solid, we know that alpha is in the order of 10 to the minus 6, right? Like what we saw earlier, like 12 times 10 to the minus 6 or whatever, 29. It's still a very small number, right? So if you do alpha to the square, then this is 10 to the minus 12 order, right? This is 10 to the minus 6 order, OK? So let's turn will be then much smaller than this term, right? So we can ignore that term, okay? So this is a much smaller term. So your delta A then should be approximately just equal to the first term, two times alpha, right? And then L square is the original area A, right? Times A times delta T, okay? So then this is for two dimensional, um, expansion is roughly twice of the linear coefficient of linear expansion times the original area times delta t okay so this is um how you can derive this in terms of the um linear coefficient of expansion all right now Similarly, for three-dimensional expansion or volume expansion, okay, it's going to be equal to the expansion of volume is equal to beta, which beta will be now three times of alpha, okay, um, times the original volume times delta t, okay. So pretty much, um, a lot of times you are just give, will be just given the linear coefficient, and then if you are ask for volume. Uh, expansion, then you just multiply by linear coefficient by three to get the coefficient of volume expansion, and then multiply that by two for the um, aerial expansion. Okay. But sometimes this beta um, could also be given directly as well. And then it would make things uh, complicated, like some of the coefficients are given as linear, some of them are given as um, volume. So then you have to pay attention to the uh, what's, what are given, okay? All right. Now, as I mentioned, typically um, material will expand or shrink. It will expand when temperature increases, it will shrink when temperature decreases. That's one exception here, um, that is for water, it actually shrinks um, when temperature goes up from zero to four, okay? So this is density. Density increase, and that means volume actually decrease, okay? So in that range, it shrinks, okay? So that's the only except, um, exception here, but from just from temperature from zero degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius, okay? After, after four degrees, then if temperature increase, it also volume will increase, which means ten, uh, density in decrease, okay? However, this um, increase in temperature uh, in volume is very small, even in that range. Okay, like in the percentage of zero point zero zero seven five percent. Okay. All right. Now, other two applications, uh, like ones you saw very often in winter, is like the potholes. Okay, so that's because in winters, the temperature tends to um, change um, largely. So like um, in the daytime, it could be um, higher um, a lot, a lot higher than uh, when it's in the evening time, okay? So then the concrete will expand and shrink, okay? So then you see potholes, all right? On the other hand, you don't see potholes quite often on walkways because walkways are usually like made by piece of concrete after piece with gaps, okay? So that prevents um, uh, potholes, but on the, on the roadway, okay, where there's no gaps in between, you'll see that, 
Okay. All right. Now another information you might um, find helpful is in the winter, when your uh, gas tank indicate indicator says low at empty. So when it hits hits empty here, actually there's a reserve of gasoline, right, in the tank. So that reserve um, it has fixed volume. Okay. So in the winter, your gasoline shrinks. So that means um, the gasoline mass, uh, if you count the numbers of molecular scales and all the mass of it, it's actually a little bit higher than it is in the summer. In the summer, it expands, right? So in winter, you might get a little bit further with your tank um, indicate it's low, but it's still very dangerous. You should find the gas station right away to fill it up, okay? But just another piece of information there. <laughs> All right, we will take a look on this one. Um, example three of the day here. So this one says early in the morning when the temperature is 5.5 degrees Celsius, gasoline is pumped into a car's 53 liter um, steel gas tank until it's filled to the top. Later in the day, the temperature rises to 27 degrees Celsius. Since the volume of gasoline increases more for a given temperature increase than the volume of the steel tank, gasoline will spill out of the tank. How much gasoline spills out in this case? All right, you are given um, now pay attention here, you're given coefficient of linear expansion on this one, but this is coefficient of volume expansion. Okay, so they are different terminologies here you want to pay attention to.
All right. So on this one, so I'm going to just um, see like if this is a tank, the tank, steel tank, right? And then inside you have gasoline. Now originally filled to the top. Um, so this tank may expand a little bit. Okay, so it goes like a little bit after expansion, but gasoline will expand more. Okay, so if you look that way, so then there's a like this excess in expansion. Okay, of gasoline that will um, come out of the tank. Okay, so basically you don't have to calculate um, what's the final volume of the gasoline and then minus the final volume of the tank, right? You just have to compare how much expansion they have, okay? So um, delta V of gasoline minus delta V of the steel tank, okay? Should give you the, um, the spill of the gasoline, right? All right. So expansion in gasoline, that should be equal to beta of gasoline times V, the initial volume, it's the same for the gasoline and the tank, right? Times delta T is also the same for gas and the tank. Delta V steel will be equal to, now it's giving you just the linear expansion, okay? So you should do three times alpha of the steel times V times delta T, okay? Because beta of the steel is equal to three times alpha of the steel itself, okay? So then taking the difference of these two, you are going to just do, so V of the steel is equal to beta of the gas minus three times alpha of the steel, right? Times V times delta T, okay? Because V and delta T, they are the same for gas and the tank, okay? Then you can plug in the numbers. So for gasoline, it's 0 0.95 times 10 to the minus three. Um, that's in, let me see what's there. What's the unit here given as? Um, no, it's up here. Just um, Kelvin inverse, okay? So Kelvin inverse, that's the same as degree Celsius inverse, okay? So I'm going to just say that's over a degree Celsius. All right. And then minus three times of, for the steel, that is times 12, times 10 to the minus six, also degree Celsius, okay? Times 53 liters, original volume, times delta T, which will be final minus initial, okay? So then this will give you about 1.04 liters, okay? And then I think um, quite a few guys um, got this one right, 1.04-ish, all right? So you can see if you fill your tank in the morning, you get extra 1.0 liters or roughly. So that's about one quarter of a gallon, okay? about, right? So it's um, better to fill the, the gas tank in the morning than in, um, in the afternoon, okay, in that sense. All right. Um, any questions you guys might have on this? All right. If not, then we are going to stop here for today and then um, we'll meet online tomorrow, okay? Just a um, reminder, we meet online tomorrow.